from self-righteousness that will not compromise, and from selfishness that gains by the oppression of others. From trusting in weapons of war and mistrusting the counsels of peace. May God deliver us. From hearing, believing, and speaking lies about others. May God deliver us. From what we say and do that drives us apart and hey, prevents peace. Hey. May God deliver us. Let us turn to number 431 and together sing, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Let us join our hearts and our voices together now as we pray. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be... We're going to do the Apostles' Creed. Come on. And now let us affirm our faith using that historic confession of the Christian church, the Apostles' Creed, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Go to the <clears throat> Glory be to the Father and to Shall be world. 
please be seated. Jason, that was for Jason, and we thank Hannah Sipe. She's our Duke uh, intern from the Divinity School this summer. Thank you, Hannah. I invite you to reach out your hand and offer a blessing and grace upon Jason. We are thankful for the God of promise and hope, new birth and opportunity. Uh, we are thankful that uh, we believe in resurrection, that out of every death there comes life, and in you life eternal and abundant. We pray for Jason this day and for Elizabeth and Worth and their family, uh, that you will bless them as they go forth, that you will use Jason in uh, marvelous ways, that he will surrender unto you all and work tirelessly for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> we are blessed in this congregation to, to have celebrations and concerns. It's a privilege for us to have concerns. Or to take them before God. Um, celebrations and concerns that you'd like. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious God, we come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts, for you are a God of grace and glory. You pour out upon us. Uh, more blessing than we could ever deserve or earn. We are grateful for the new lives to Mary Harrell and Collins. We are grateful for uh, the welcome you are preparing for Ethel. We pray for Ethel and Mary and Francis and Bev and all those in the Greg and all those in the hospital, all those in need of your care. We ask you, Lord, to be with them and strengthen them and help them to know your presence. For the family that lost uh, sons this week in Swansboro, we pray tender, tender mercy and care, healing and strength, and <coughs> the love of that church family. For Dr. Milton Gilbert, for the ministry that he shared in this place and the love and relationships that he built and left, he, we pray for his heart as he um, grieves and yet celebrates as well Lucretia's homecoming. Lord, be with us and guide us. May we as a church always seek to 
to put you and your glory first, not to work for praise, but for your praise alone. For we pray all this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is not in your bulletin. We just did this uh, a moment ago. Uh, Ed Slatterer, uh, I thought we were going to do this at the end of the month, but he's here and ready to go. So if you'll turn in your hymn books to page 40. Ed, come and join me here. Ed is going to... Uh, renew his faith and, and, and become a covenant member of First United Methodist Church. So I'm going to ask him and you these questions. On behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Will, um, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and support her in its ministries? And will you uh, support First United Methodist Church by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Yes. On the, uh, uh, let's see, on the page 43... Members of the household of God, I commend Ed to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. Ed, we welcome you. He's been a part of this church a long time, but we welcome you formally. God bless you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hear this reading from Psalm 34. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in Him. O oh, fear the Lord, you His holy ones, for those who fear Him have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Which of you desires life and covets many days to enjoy good? Keep your tongues from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. And now let us continue our worship of Almighty God by the giving of God's tithes and our offerings.
As we continue to prepare ourselves for the word of Almighty God, we open our eyes to the world that God has made, but that we too often have broken. So let us sing number 426, Behold a Broken World. At this time, I invite any children that might be present who would like to come forward for a special time with Miss Kitty. Do we have any young people? Here we go, Cooper, come on up. Good job. Cooper, how are you this morning? School out? Good. I have a Bible verse for you. Psalms 34, 8. See that God is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Refuge means that it's a safe place to be. I'm going to talk to you about this box I have this morning. I'm going to let you guess what's in it, but it would take us all day if I didn't give you some hints. So I'll give you some hints. And when you decide what's in it, Cooper, don't tell any of these people out here until I tell you, okay? Then I'll let you tell them. First of all, it doesn't live in my house, and I don't think it lives in your house. It likes to live in creeks and swamps and marshes and places like that. It loves to eat bugs, and it hops around. Now, don't tell anybody what you think it is. In fact, Cooper, I bet you know what it is, but don't tell these people out here because I want to tell you, too, about God. You know, you don't know what's in here, but you do know what's in here, right? Because I've given you hints, just like with God. I don't see God. Do you see him? But we know he's with us every day, and that's because there's a book that tells us about him. What is this book? 
the Bible. He tells about all the wonderful things God does, all the miracles he's done. And even though we can't see him, we know from what everybody has told us that God is good and he loves you, Cooper, and he loves us all. And just like here, you pretty much know what's in here. You want to tell everybody? A frog. <laughs> Let's look and see. <gasps> There's a frog. I've got a frog for you. F R O G. F is forever. R is rely. O is on. And G is God, forever rely on God and take refuge in him. Can we have a prayer? Dear God, we don't see you, but we know you're with us every day and that you love us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Mm. Woo! Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm sorry, y'all. I got, I, got I got a condition. I, uh, I'm infected with a virus. Um, I got something called the, the HS. You know about the HS. Once you get it, there's, there's no cure for it. It just, just takes over sometimes. You know, the, the Holy Spirit trying to go viral in here. Praise the Lord. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now my wife's here. She's going to go tell Jonathan Mills that I stole that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be preaching also from 1 Peter 3, 8 through 14. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, Repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you. Let us pray. God of present perfection, God of peace, Prince of Peace, we pray that you would pursue us with your penetrating Pentecostal power, that we might truly be able to seek peace and pursue it. May all else that would threaten your call on our lives fade into the background. In your name we pray. Amen. As Pastor Powell mentioned, we are beginning a new sermon series on viral verses. Something being viral means that it starts in one location and then spreads out much further than that one beginning instance, affecting and even infecting far beyond wherever the epicenter was. In some ways, I think that if there is a good place for me to leave Viral verses is a good place for me to end my time as an associate pastor here. I think this because the hope that we have whenever one of us moves to a different place is that God's work might go viral through that person's life. The work that you all have done in my life, what God has done for me and to me, and through all of you to me is about to impact Murfreesboro. So watch out, Murfreesboro. <laughs> All of the wisdom and education impacted in us, we pray, is about to go viral in another place. When we talk about going viral, we often talk about our computers, or we talk about the internet. 
With the internet, we have the ability to see things go viral and to spread out immediately and touch everywhere in the world. Sometimes things go viral that are positively powerful and impactful, like a video of a stranger helping out a neighbor during a national natural disaster. On the other hand, sometimes terrible videos go viral, like a video a number of years ago called The Ugliest Woman in the World that 10 million people watched and brought shame and hurt on this lady. In an age when information spreads as fast as lightning, the church should not be the taillights of society, only deciding to spread the good news quickly as a last effort. But we ought to be like the headlights at the forefront spreading the good news of what God does and who God is through every way possible. The viral verse for today is one that I have carried with me for a long time. Whenever we were first talking about me preaching today and I was thinking about what sermon text I should use, Pastor Powell said, how about the one tattooed on your side? <laughs> I thought it was a good idea. So today I bring you this quote from my side, but first from the Bible, which went about as viral as a verse could in the Bible. It was both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Seek peace and pursue it. Turn to your neighbor and say, Seek peace and pursue it. Now lay some peace on your other neighbor. We talk about peace all the time. You might be a United Methodist if you have ever ended an email with the phrase, Grace and peace. You might be a millennial if you used to have a peace frog on one of your belongings. You might be an urban millennial if when you were younger you ended a conversation saying, peace out. <laughs> you might be from Generation X if when you hear peace, it makes you think of the quote, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. You might be a baby boomer if when you were younger you grew your hair out longer than mine and listened to psychedelic music and talked about peace, man. You might be part of the greatest generation if you hear the word peace and your mind goes back to VE Day when World War II came to an end. And you might be a human if you talk a good talk about peace but have a hard time living it out in your daily life. You might be human if you have a hard time seeking peace and pursuing it. What does it mean for us to seek peace and pursue it? At first glance, this text seems to be a bit redundant. Isn't it the same thing to seek and pursue something? The words seek and pursue have slightly different meanings, though. As you remember, this verse was from the Old Testament and the Psalms, and then the New Testament in 1 Peter. So I'm going to geek out for a little bit with some Greek and some Hebrew and tell you what each one means. So first, seek. Seek in Hebrew means to desire or to request something. And in Greek, it means to think or meditate on something that you want or to crave something. Pursue, on the other hand, in the Hebrew can have the meaning of chasing. Like when your dog gets out and chases after a bunny or a cat, running after something in order to pounce on it. The Greek has the same meaning, but it can also mean to press on towards a goal. You see the difference there? Seek peace is an internal thing that we do when we think about it, when we want it, when we ask God for it. Pursue peace is something that we do with our body. You have to do both parts in this scripture. A number of months ago, we preached about peace and spent a long time defining it in terms of how we seek peace. We talked about how it's the presence of God in our lives. How peace means that we're filled with God's presence and it starts on the inside. It starts with spiritual disciplines. Peace comes through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ getting stronger. As Jesus comes into us, the unpeacefulness goes out. This is what it means in the biblical sense for us to seek peace. From what I've studied, 
the biblical idea of peace has two parts, the spiritual and the social, both of which go together. So if we're only trying to have one, we do not have full peace. It looks to me like full peace is just an idea until it makes the journey from our minds and our souls into our muscles. What does it look like for us to pursue peace? At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he said that he came to give sight to the blind, liberty to the captives, and deliverance to the oppressed. He sought peace and pursued it. Because he didn't have just a spiritual or just a social gospel. It wasn't either individual or corporate. It was both about the me and also about the we both about our hearts and minds and the physical things that they have to deal with on a daily basis. Since God created the physical world, it only makes sense that God cares about what happens here. If we are to be like Jesus, we need to give sight to the blind, liberty to the captives, and deliverance to the oppressed. We need to pursue peace. But where do we start? good start is by connecting with people who've gone before us. We start by realizing that this work we're called to do is something that others also are trying to do. Today, in the life of the United Methodist Church, is a day called Peace with Justice Sunday. And churches all over the world are focusing on things that happen, on the, the negative things that happen whenever our institutions and people and world fails to have peace. Things like money inequality, people who harvest our food not having enough food for themselves, the international sex trade, the internet sex trade for that matter, and many other things. When our eyes are open to the lack of peace, to the lack of justice, we are able then to pursue peace, knowing fully what it means. Martin Luther King Jr. said that it is easier to see where there is a lack of justice than it is to define what is meant by the term justice. We may not completely be able to say what we mean by justice, but we can say by the power of the Holy Spirit inside of our consciences when we see it, that is unjust. Justice and peace are connected the way a foundation is connected to a house cannot have one without the other, and when you do have one, the other can stand. It's like I tweeted this week for those of you who do Twitter. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. If we are going to know God's peace, we first have to know also what is working against it. God's presence inside of us shows us that. If we are going to give sight to the blind, liberty to the captives, and deliverance to the oppressed, we first need to know what is blinding, what is enslaving, what is oppressing our brothers and sisters around the world. Pursuing peace can be overwhelming when we see the injustices. Consider some of the unpeaceful, unjust realities around the world realities into which the Spirit could cause us to pursue peace. Every day, approximately 29,000 people in the world die of hunger or hunger-related diseases. 100 million children from ages 6 to 11 years of age are receiving no education and will likely join the 900 million adults who are illiterate around the world. One billion children do not have clean water or sanitary waste disposal. That's one-sixth of the world's population, and that's just the children. Into these places, with these, our fellow humans, we are called to pursue peace. Now let's consider some of the unpeaceful, unjust realities about the country in which we live. I know it's difficult. The United States has 5% of the world's population, and yet we consume over one-third of the world's natural resources, while we generate 19% of the world's waste. We're the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, sucking its resources dry. 
and we have a hard time sharing these resources. We currently give less than one-tenth of one percent of our national income to humanitarian aid. Number one country in the world is Luxembourg, which gives an average of $352 per person to international aid, while the United States averages just $23 per person. Now, I know humanitarian aid isn't our tithes and offerings, but with God's wealth that God has allowed each of us to steward, we can be an example by pursuing peace with what God has given us. This country is a bountiful place, it's a beautiful place, but we have a history of not being peaceful. Hundreds of years before there was even a United States of America, there were European settlers who participated in the trade of human beings, buying enslaved people to work for them. Today, we are still being hurt from that original sin, and millions of us find it necessary to say, Black lives matter because it does not go without saying. When we look at the prison industry that locks up minorities at astounding rates, when we look at the job inequalities in our country, when we look at the disparity in school systems, even in our own county, we realize that we have a lot to do to seek peace and pursue it. Like a song on the Christian radio says, a song that I love, it's not enough to do something. It's time for us, it's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. So let's seek peace and pursue it. When we look at the places of unrest and suffering around us, it's daunting. When we think about how Jesus might call us to bring the gospel of life everlasting to those whose lives are suffering, it's more than we can bear to think about it on our own. I confess that I often feel depressed when I think about all that I am not doing to pursue peace compared to the needs around us. But, but then, but then we are brought back to the prayer that we started this morning in worship with. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. As we seek peace and pursue it, we must keep in our minds this prayer. We are not the ones who created peace, but we are called to embody it, being, as Jesus said, peacemakers, not the violent peacekeepers. We simply follow Jesus, something that causes us to bring peace, to make peace, simply by who we are. When we follow Jesus, he brings a certain serenity that allows us to accept the things we cannot change. However, Jesus also brings a courage that would empower us to pursue peace for change in ways that are greater than we thought possible. We cannot simply stop at the accept the things I cannot change line. Whenever we begin to change the things we can, we begin to realize that God can do immeasurably more through us than we thought possible. Whenever we begin to change the things we can, we realize that it's enough, and God does the rest. As you go out from here to pursue peace, I pray that God would cause you to have the wisdom to know how and where to pursue peace. I pray that God would bring you all together as peaceable people, who make peace simply by living out the Christian life that pursues it. I pray that you would never walk away from unpeaceful people because they don't seek peace, but that you would love them until they do. I pray that your imagination would be about the possibility of what God might do anyway because you all are peacemakers. We cannot fully know the possibility for peace by ourselves. So let us seek peace and pursue it together. Our final song in worship this day is This Is My Song. Let us all stand and sing together, number 437.
Following the benediction, I invite you to participate in the choral benediction. May God grant you the serenity to accept the things you cannot change, the courage to change the things you can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Go in peace. Yeah.